There are several times when strange things begin to happen in heaven that there is a witness of that which is going on in heaven upon the face of the earth. At that point in time when God finds a group of people, a person that is tuned up and hooked up to heaven, what happens is that God grants the mercy and grace for him to be able to participate in that which has broken out in heaven. When days like this come, we need to know that they are not ordinary. It is in response to a mighty thing that has erupted in the heavens that we bask in this level of glory and joy. It doesn't end there. Enjoying the field, connecting with eternity, flowing in the pipeline, uh, receiving the river that makes the cities in heaven glad into your spirit, so much so that joy leaps out of your very being like an armed man. That's not the best that this kind of an occasion has to offer. We need to tune and turn in the prophetic spirit to understand what exactly is happening that is causing so much joy in heaven. For instance, the Bible says there's joy in heaven when a sinner comes and repents and gives his life to God and comes to a realization. He said there's joy. In that moment, if an intercessor is piping into heaven, he will be able to receive the transmission of joy. And he will know somebody has been added to the kingdom light. But you see, we need to find out what makes heaven rejoice. In the next five minutes, the spirit of prophecy will hit this building. So as to give us insight into what is going on. It will, it will hit the building. Because God wants to reveal to us where we have arrived. In heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The Bible says there is a river. The streams thereof make glad the cities of God. Now as we began the service, I was wondering. Because the more we pressed into the deep waters, my message failed. My message was dangling. I was praying for his deliverance. It was dangling. It was dangling. And I was praying for the deliverance of the seven. But it came to pass when another mesh of glory hit the house. And the flood took my sermon. So it's not all about a sermon tonight. We need to find out what is happening in heaven. Many times we're basking the spirit. I remember it was in ABU Zaria. The mighty hand of God came down that night. Many people could not stand on their feet because of the weight of the glory. Many knocked down. There was this sister that came strongly under the influence of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And the Holy Ghost was, was aggressive on our life that night. We were seeking and looking to the people that had the gift of prophecy to, co to come to the rescue. But we had to wait because when the sister was slain, she was on ground for one hour. So we had to wait for her to revive. Hallelujah. Amen. We were expecting that if she revives, she will come up with a, a, a compendium. We were expecting that if she revives, she will come up with an insight that will cause us to run in the right direction. And when she was quickened, we now raised her up. What happened? She said she saw a light, a light, a light. Ah! And we were confused. We are locked up anytime the spirit of prophecy doesn't come to give us understanding. We cannot understand the things that is going on in the heavens. And tonight, in the next five minutes, the spirit of prophecy will hit this building. The anointing to prophesy will come upon you. It may, it may be that you have never prophesied before. But today, God will speak because we are in the dark. We don't know what's happening. We are just basking in the euphoria. Well, the crucible was opened a little. And I don't know where this one came from, but it's accurate. He said, my people should not be afraid of darkness. I am their light. And the light shines brighter when it seems the darkness is thickest. Hallelujah. Amen. Just in case you have been, your pathway in recent times has been 
in the corridors of darkness, blackness, and thick darkness. Hallelujah. And you look for light, but you behold darkness. For brightness, but you walk in darkness. The Lord is saying corporately and to some specific individuals, I am your light. In the next five minutes, the spirit of prophecy will hit this building. Hallelujah. You need to know when you, to ask God for understanding. When you are sure that the Holy Ghost is moving, the next thing to do is to find out what he's doing. So that you can receive some profit from his manifestation. The Bible says that the gifts of the Spirit are given unto every man to profit with all. There's a dimension of profit that every gift of the Spirit sustains. Right now, what we need is not the gift of healing. Right now, what we need is not the gift of faith. Right now, what we need is the gift of prophecy. Let the language of the Spirit be interpreted and be brought to human knowledge so that we can identify with it. I hope you are not tired. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, let's start this way. You may be seated for the next two minutes. Maybe I need to discuss with us what the gift of prophecy is for the next five minutes. What exactly is the gift of prophecy? When the Bible says a man prophesied, what exactly did he do? What influence came upon him? What ability did he receive on the account of the influence that came? Prophecy. Prophecy exists in different planes, manifests through different channels, and finds expression in different dimensions. Basically, as the name prophecy is, the most basic definition of prophecy is when a man speaks forth the mind of God. When the mind of God is articulated and declared, it is prophecy. But as, as simple as that definition is, we need to understand that you cannot speak the mind of God except you have given insight into the mind of God. And just in case you are given insight into the mind of God, you also need to be given utterance. You also need to be given spirit energized utterance. That is the language that communicates the heart of God to the heart of man. So prophecy is two dimensional. First of all, is accessibility to the heart of God. And secondly, an empowering by the spirit of God through what is called utterance to declare exactly what you have picked number three element in prophecy prophecy and the declaration of prophecy is sponsored and tied to the measure of faith that was created on the account of access to the heart of god every time you have access to the heart of god there's a measure of faith that that revelation grants you in order for you to have the authority to declare the mind of God. And you cannot declare the mind of God if you don't have utterance from God. So prophecy is, there's a revelational aspect of prophecy. Accessing the mind of God. There is a fifth dimension of prophecy. Receiving authority from God to declare his mind. As though you were God. Because prophecy speaks the mind of God in first person. For instance, if someone is under the influence of prophecy and he's he, God borrows his vocal cord and God speaks to his vocal cord as God. For instance, you hear the man say, I am in the midst of my people. I want to heal and deliver. God has borrowed it his mouth and God speaks in prophecy in the first person. In order for you to be able to speak for God as God's mouthpiece, you need some level of qualification and stature. That is what the measure of faith that you receive when the revelation came to you comes to do inside of you it comes to give you the authority to be able to declare the counsel of god as though you were god did you get it to that point 
I said, did you get you to that point? All right, it's flowing. Oh, it's, it's happening. The lines are open in heaven. So as, as we are talking and discussing, just be attentive in your spirit. All right? I'm just trying to give us, give us a biblical understanding of what prophecy is and the need for prophecy in the current day church and the times in which prophecy is inevitable and there are seasons in which no other gift of the spirit can take the place of prophecy. It's a strategic gift that has a capacity for direction and instruction. It is a blessing to the body of Christ. It gives us light, insight, hindsight, and foresight. It is in its revelational scope. It can reach into the past. It can give insight into the present. And it can give understanding of the future. But you must understand that for you to be able to prophesy, it is written. And the man must prophesy according to the measure of faith that is given him. That means you only have faith enough to declare accurately exactly that which you have received from God. And just in case the faith as you are speaking, as you are speaking, as you are speaking, and the faith you receive by that revelation now is extinguished. It's an indication of the fact that you need to stop. God is no longer talking. Just in case you, you spoke again, there's no authority to speak on behalf of God anymore because the faith that gives you stature an authority to so speak is no longer in existence in your spirit. And if you violate and keep on speaking, even the people you are speaking to, if they are on the same frequency, on the same frequency, the time the faith dies down and a human being talks, that we differentiate the voice of God from the voice of man. The Lord give you understanding in the name of Jesus Christ. Prophecy. Speaking the heart of God. Hallelujah. In Bible school, prophecy was categorized among the vocal gifts. The gifts that require that God borrows your mouth to speak. But you see, I have a problem with that categorization. And the problem I have with that categorization is that the heart of God and the mind of God, as you know, it's a mystery. Except the heart of God is revealed, the heart of God cannot be declared. And just in case you carry out a declaration without understanding the heart of God, it's a false declaration. And the body of Christ in our time is used to a style of ministry that is hinged upon declarations that are not precipitates of the heart of God. And the preacher mounts the pulpit and he says, next week something's going to happen. Except God revealed that. That utterance is a cliche. It's a preaching cliche. Just trying to put a conjunction to the preaching. There's no power and reality in it. Instead of, in fact, if you hear such a prophecy that is devoid of revelation, an utterance of that nature, that is devoid of revelation and faith, it doesn't happen. Somebody might speak, somebody is telling me now, in the congregation, then what, where is the place of prophetic declaration? A prophetic declaration comes when faith is born in your spirit as you declare the word of God. Faith is born in your spirit that makes that word of God one with your spirit at that time. You possess that word by reason of faith that has been imparted into your spirit. And the word is so strong upon your spirit. And is you have that word at that time because of the spirit of faith that is at work is one with your spirit. You have it so you can give it out and it will come to pass. That's different from prophecy. That's an operation of the spirit of faith. When the spirit of faith is at work, it gives you the capacity to be able to say what God is saying the way God says it. Do you understand the difference? Oh, you don't get it. Hallelujah. The spirit of faith empowers you to say what God is saying the way he's saying. The Bible says we have received the same spirit of faith. Alright? We say because God 
has said. The spirit of faith makes you say what God has said. It gives you the authority and there's a measure of faith that is imparted by the spirit of faith so that you can say what God has said. The spirit of faith was illustrated in God during the time of creation. You realize that God created in creation, God was using the spirit of faith to call those things that be not as though they were and those things came to pass. The same spirit is still alive. And that spirit can come upon you and give you an understanding of God's emphasis. You were preaching so many things. You were saying so many things. But something hangs upon your spirit. It's as if it stands out from the scriptures. It stands out from your utterances. And that one glues to your spirit. It means that God wants you to give voice to something he's proclaiming. That's the spirit of faith. It comes at the spur of the moment to give you the capacity to be able to say what God is saying. And if you say it, it is creative in nature. Even if the thing that was spoken about was, is not in existence, it has capacity to create it and to make it manifest. That's different from prophecy. Even though it is still speaking forth. I hear pastors say, that prophecy is speaking forth. That's not true. No. The prophetic declaration that came out is not prophecy. Because prophecy has an intrinsic character and nature. The fact that you just spoke forth on behalf of God doesn't mean you have prophesied. I'm going to show you from the Bible. Don't worry. Those things have bothered me many years ago and I had to go back to scriptures to really verify it. Amen. Oh, you are not with me. It's not every speaking forth on the behalf of God that is prophecy. Because prophecy has a character. The simple gift of prophecy empowers you to desire the heart of God and one, bring comfort to people. Desire the heart of God, bring instruction to people and rebuke to people. Desire the heart of God and bring exhortation to people. Exhortation talks about someone that is discouraged. The words of God that are uttered to make that person motivated from inside. Not a carnal kind of motivation that a coach gives to the players and sacks them up. No. A motivation that hits the very core of your sorrow and takes it away and leaves you gallant again. Now, so prophecy has a peculiar nature. Do you understand what I'm talking about now? And if it's not in the category of comfort, of exhortation, of instruction or rebuke, and you speak forth for God, that it doesn't line up with these categories, it is not prophecy. It's a declaration. Did you get it? You are not with me. It's that simple. We have not yet started going into scriptures. It's a simple stuff. So it's not every speaking forth for God that is prophecy. You can speak things under the influence of the Holy Spirit that doesn't amount to prophecy. Prophecy has a function. It is it, 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 released to achieve a purpose. Do you get me now? When, when, okay, 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 okay. Let me calm down. Now, let's say in a congregation, somebody dies. And everybody is so heartbroken because of the death that has taken place. Alright? And then we just come for one of the worship services. And somehow, in the midst of the worship service, somebody begins to prophesy. And the things the, be the person begins to say, begins to give us insight. Do you understand? What led to the person's death? Maybe before that time, we were struggling to preach to the person. And then during that season, the person accepted the Lord and became fervent in the Lord. Do you understand that? And then in the midst of the fervency, the person now died. And I said, oh my God. We have been hunting him around town, trying to bring him to God. And now he has finally come into the kingdom. And just when he came into the kingdom, he was cut off. Lord, why did your great power not protect him? Why did your mighty strength not bring him deliverance? But you see, it happens to be that God knows the end from the beginning. And God knows the beginning from the end. And maybe in God's template, 
when he saw into the future, he saw that that person that came to God was going to backslide again. And it was in his interest at this time for him to make the person vulnerable so that the devil, in his nature of wickedness, would take him away. In that taking, according to God's reasoning and perspective, it was in the interest of the church and in the interest of the brethren that that person had to go at that time. But we don't know. Oh my God. Are you, are you still here today? And then somebody, somebody begins to, suddenly somebody begins to prophesy. And the prophecy revealed from the perspective of God, what actually ensued that led to that event. And as a person gave us the full scope of the perspective of God concerning the issue, the body and the sorrow was transformed to joy. That is prophecy. When prophecy is released, there is a, an effect that is expected. There is a target that is desirable before pro prophecy finds expression. It is constructive. It's not, it's not just vague speaking. It is a kind of speaking that has an intention behind it. Do you understand? So it's not just speak forth. But the speaking must be in the texture of either comfort, in the texture of either instruction, direction, or rebuke, in the texture of exhortation. Do you see now? And that's a simple gift of prophecy. It must carry one of the, those characteristics. And it happens to be that Paul, in his teaching of prophecy, made us to understand that every believer that is born again in the body of Christ can prophesy. That's interesting. Have you ever prayed before? And a scripture was laid upon your spirit. If that has happened to you before, let me see your hand up. If that has never happened to you, let me see your hand up, please. Never. If it has never happened to you, you were praying or walking on the streets, and a scripture was laid upon your spirit, if it has never happened to you, let me see your hand up. Just be bold, don't worry. The teaching today is for you. You will understand it. You'll be able to identify when such things happen. Are you... Raise your hand. All right. All right. Okay. Maybe it's because of you we need to teach. If not, uh, would have flowed into the prophetic arm of the service to gain understanding of the things that have happened. Without the gift of prophecy, many things will happen in the spirit realm. We will feel it in our spirit. We will bask in it and enjoy it. And our understanding will be unfruitful. Are you still with me now? Now, that's the simple gift of prophecy. The simple gift of prophecy empowers every believer and any believer whatsoever by the Spirit of God to be able to speak to others in comfort, to be able to speak to others in, by instruction, by, 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 by rebuke, all right? To be able to speak to others in exhortation. The simple gift of prophecy. Now, that time when you were praying and the scripture was laid upon, it was the gift of prophecy that was at work. You have picked what was on the mind of God at that moment. The prophecy might be directed at you. The prophecy might be directed at others. Hey, are you still with me? Yes, you can be praying about a situation and then suddenly God now gives you a scripture. A scripture that is most relevant to the case of your prayer. The spirit of prophecy has come upon you. Maybe the Lord laid that scripture on your heart for you to communicate it to the person you're praying about. And then you now go there simply and said, while I was praying for you, I picked this. This scripture is generally available in the Bible. But yesterday, I picked it up, not just as something in the Bible, I picked it up as something for you. Do you understand it now? Now, there are so many things in the Bible but except the Holy Spirit witnesses it to your spirit, it's not active for you. No, you don't know. Some people read in the Bible that Jesus walked on water and they took a seven day fast and moved to the water side and said, God, we are going to jump in by faith and you are going to hold us. And they went to the deepest part, the place that if you fall in, you cannot recover yourself. 
so that they can put God under pressure. They can make him have hypertension and he will be moved somehow. And when they jump, they die. The newspapers covered it. Seven Christian brethren drowned by faith. And some senior ministers of the gospel had to inquire what led to that disgrace to the body of Christ. And Jesus told them they were acting on logos. Please help me tell your neighbor it was logos. They just found it from the scripture and they picked it up and they took off like a tornado. When you take off that way, you crush land. Meanwhile, I still need to strike a balance on that. You can be praying about something and you can take a scripture that supports the point and pray about it. So you are using that scripture. That's what we call supplication. You are bringing strong reasons to God why he should do the things you are requesting him to do. Are you still with me now? But if it is prophecy, it must be a rhema. God must speak that to your spirit. And if he speaks it to your spirit, it becomes what? Your own. If you act on it and he says, walk on water, and he spoke it in your spirit, if you stretch your feet on River Benway, it will become a Persian rug. It only has power when it was directed at your heart. So prophecy can come to you and prophecy can come through you. All right? And the Bible says that every believer can prophesy. But you see, it's not every level of prophecy that every believer can prophesy. Can I have my board? I need my board now. Now let's clarify it because it's going to happen in the meeting. People will prophesy. Amen. Hallelujah. Turn your Bible with me. Let's go do some Bible study for the next 15 minutes. The guys took off and went to the water side. They wanted to terrorize God into acting. And God did not commit himself. They were acting on what? Oh, you guys are not here. <laughs> they were acting on the written word. The written word is not the living word. The written word is the one you find in scripture. And if you read the, um, the written word is very important. Hey, are you here? The written word is very important. It's a compendium of the thoughts of God. We are enjoying to study the written word because when we study the written word, we know the way God thinks. We are enjoying to study the written word because if God speaks to us, his speaking does not violate the written word. We are enjoined to study the written word so that by it our feet can be guided. There are principles in the written word. There are commandments in the written word that I expect to become a basis of regulation of our lives as Christians. For instance, the Bible says an elder must be husband of one wife. Just in case you are to be nominated to be an elder. The Bible regulation must be fulfilled in your life. We must check you and check your village. And confirm that apart from the wife you have in town, you don't have another one in Boko. The Lord give you understanding. Now, you see, the written word gives us commandments and regulations by which our lives should be based. The written word gives us instructions from God. There are general instructions that are applicable to everyone that is a believer in Christ Jesus. The other day, some young men studied the Bible and felt that they have captured a new revelation. What was this revelation? That tithing was not a New Testament practice. And as such, it was out of place to tithe in the New Testament era. And I told them that they were not faithful to the written word. Because by the time we go to the book of Hebrews, the Bible begins to give us insight. In Hebrews chapter 7, the Bible says that Levi was the family among the 12 tribes of Israel that was saddled with the responsibility of receiving tithes from the people of God. But in the book of Hebrews chapter 7, the Bible makes us to understand 
that Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek. And the time that Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek, Levi was not yet born. Levi was in the loins of Abraham. Levi also gave tithes to Melchizedek because he was in his loins when Abraham gave tithes. Amen? Amen. Abraham did not give tithes under the law. What was the dispensation that Abraham operated under? Please help me. He did not operate under the law. So what dispensation was that? Abraham operated under grace. Now it's needful for you to understand that righteousness was not attainable under the law. But the Bible says that Abraham believed God and it was counted for the Greek word there say it was logically calculated as righteousness. Righteousness was a possibility in the oppression of Abraham. It was an oppression of faith. Do you realize that under the law you don't need faith? It's written in the Bible. No. The law doesn't operate by faith. The law operates by doing and observation. But Abraham was operating by faith. And faith is not the function of the law. He was not operating under the law. Grace was discovered even before the law came. My friend. Now if I press further you will see it more. <laughs> Did you get it to that point now? Oh you are not with me. He was operating under grace. And that's why the Bible says that we are descendants of Abraham spiritually. He pioneered that pathway. But the full dimensions of that pathway never became operative. We could not see it fully until Jesus came. And then now we are called the sons of Abraham by faith. Space and time does not affect us anymore. Because we operate on the currency of eternity, which is faith. It's the spirit of God himself that imparts the substance that is the basis and the foundation of your conviction into your spirit. That substance is eternal. It's not of the law. It's not regulated by regulations. It's purely of the spirit. Do you get it? Now, how did I get here? Anytime I try to prove something, I veer off. Please help me now. How did I get here? Because the last five minutes I was talking about prophecy. Now I'm, I'm basking somewhere else. Some guys... Some guys studied the Bible and came out with one scripture and tried to make a doctrine out of it. Then I said, sorry, you are not in tune with God. Because Abraham was operating under grace and Abraham gave tithes. And I tell you the truth, tithing, if it was given to Melchizedek, and Melchizedek is an eternal personality that doesn't have father, mother, or descent, it means that even in the new Jerusalem, we'll still be giving tithes to Jesus. So the young men took, and we, we arrived at that by Logos. Not Rema. What? It was what? Written. You get it? So in issues of instruction, Logos. In the issues of your feet being guided. For instance, we hear Solomon say that you should not be a friend of an angry man. How many of you have obeyed that? You have a friend that when he, 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 he fuels up, swears, you will need to chain his right hand and be pouring him Block, ice block, ice block, ice block. So they're going down the sun. <laughs> Meanwhile, Solomon says, Don't be a friend. See, those things have already been judged. <laughs> Please tell your neighbor, let's be faithful to the logos. We are all looking for Rema, but there's so much in the logos that we have not seen. Meanwhile, there's also a prophetic aspect of the Logos because it's the thoughts of God. Are you here? Now, for instance, the Bible says the way of the wicked. Secondly, the Bible says the way of the righteous. That's prophetic. How do I mean? Now, there are several things that are on the way of the wicked. And if a man begins to operate that way, you don't need to wait for 10 years to tell him the outcome. This way you are going, if you remain here for 10 years' time, it, it, the prophetic end has been judged. You don't get me. It's the Logos that gave us that insight. In the Logos, we see many generations where inventories of generations were tabulated. 
Why all those chronology? They said this king Ahab, this king Rehoboam, this. Why all of those human history? They want to show you the pattern. So that if you decide to take their way, be assured that their end is your portion. So the Logos is also prophetic in nature. Oh, uh, there's a young man in this hall and you are still trying to be a guy. With the low waist jeans, you believe that the world is in your pocket. We have seen your type. The Bible has your prototype in scripture. If only you were a friend of the Logos, you would have, you would have seen your your end. <laughs> Are you with me now? Now, so those guys were acting on what? On logo. Jesus did not quicken that word. <laughs> Jesus did not quicken that word into their spirit. And they thought that with fasting, dry fasting and prayer, they will compel him to what? Meanwhile, he's king. You don't compel him. You only come and wait for him until he decides to speak. And it might take 48 days before he shakes. Oh, I say, all right, go. But you see, if you are so wise as to jump out of the room before that 48 day when he decided to speak, you will act on logo. The scripture just opened in my spirit now. The Bible says, keep that back thy servant from presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be upright and innocent of great transgressions. Please help me ask the next person close to you, especially if the person is a, is, is a pastor. What is the great transgression? Ask your pastor. Please request for an answer. Evangelist Chris, what is the great, great transgression? In my teaching some time ago, I showed us the difference between sin, iniquity, trespass, and transgression. Now, so what is a great transgression? Now, it, it, uh, teaching should be a build-up of what we have done in the past. What is the great transgression? See, keep back thy servant from presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be upright and innocent of great transgression. What is the great transgression? It's when you act on presumption. Presumption is a situation where somebody takes off in error. Presuming that God will deliver him. Presuming that it is where that guy is not operating in faith and the bible says anything that is not of faith is sin because he could not spend his time to wait on god until god decides to give him rema he takes us like a tornado presuming that god will take charge presuming that god will be god of signs and wonders who are you to determine what god will be and when he wants to be such so it takes off on presumption. And everything that is doing is outside of faith. It is flesh. It is sin. And God will not respond to logo. What happened to the guys? They were operating on presumption. Expecting that if they fast and go to the riverside, God will have a heart attack. And he will show up trembling. And give them red carpet reception. But they don't realize that he is king. Please help me tell your neighbor he is king. Just in case you cry, to change where he is. Somebody died and a pastor cried, say, where were you when my son died? And that day God was gracious and he responded, I was on the throne. Amen. Now just understand that he is king. And because he is king, he is not entitled to, to answering all your questions. Sister, he will not answer all your questions because he is king. He chooses to do what he wants to do, especially as he has to do with his divine purpose. And as mortal beings, 
We are insufficient beings in everything. In knowledge, in ability, in strength, in wisdom. We were designed by default to be dependent on God totally. Anytime you stand out in your microwave knowledge and wisdom and you ask God why. Every time people ask God why, when he told them the reason for why, they had to repent. Why? Because he is king. The Bible says Sarah received strength to bring forth because she judged him faithful who had promised. That means Sarah saw God as a faithful God irrespective of situations and circumstances. Irrespective of the fact that situations were not in her favor. She, by an act of faith, maintained God in a light of faithfulness. Every time situations go bad, the devil comes around your trying to discredit God and many of us play to the gallows and accept the whispers of Satan. And it's on the strength of those whispers and arguments that we normally go to God and say, why? But he is king. He can decide to answer you, he will still be gone. He can decide not to answer you and you will still be gone. Many strange things have happened around my life and I wanted to know why. There was a time that I used to struggle to know why. I would feel bad if I don't know why. Until one day I found out that God is king. We don't live by his explanations. We live by his instructions. Please help me preach to your neighbor. You don't live by his explanations. You live by his instructions. There is something that God will never obscure from your face. And that's his instructions. He will allow his instructions be bare before you. Because that is your lot and portion. You don't sit in the council that demands explanations from God. Why? He's king. Amen. Okay, I'm going to explain. You feel bad. All right, I'll explain now. I went to a city to preach. It was the city of Jaws. And I saw a damsel fair in complexion. Her level of fairness was even from the crown of her head to the soles of her feet. So she not compromised the fairness with the touch of the, ble of the bleaching cream. She was fair to her feet in the name of Jesus. <laughs> and when I, you see, I happened to study fine art to uh, an advanced level. And because of that, I understand color. I understand texture and I understand symmetry. When you behold this stamp cell from the crown of her head to the sole of her feet, there was no blemish in her makeup. She could be numbered among one of the goddesses that walks around. Oh, Jesus. You see, the Lord gave you understanding. <laughs> and you cannot behold that lady without desiring that you will match with her to the altar. Even if it's on a Friday night, you desire a match past. If you're still here, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. And I went there, and that day the prophetic unction was at work. And it paved way for me solidly. By the time I had moved in the oil, I had won a congregation. But when I was reaching out to the lady to tell her my intentions of how that my journey in the wilderness will have to end at her doorpost. I was constrained by the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Many times you see a pastor, you behold him as he ejects on the pulpit. The truth is, pastors fall in love more better. My God, Jesus. If, 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 you, if you can feel me, you say amen. And I was imagining how it would look like if I took that damsel to my village in the very core of the mangrove swamp forest where coconut trees grew without fertilizer. I was wondering if I take her down the aisle, it will make news for one year. While I went to drop my proposal, the Lord restrained me. And I was I vowed to be a slave of the Lord. So I traveled home without proposing for a three hour journey from just to Abuja and my understanding 
was unfruitful. Guess what the question was? <laughs> Malento Moskela. That was when I knew he was a king. He refused to answer me. Until I said, okay, all right, I know you are king. This, even if you decide not to answer, no problem. We'll just march on like that. I don't need to know everything. When I decided that I don't need to know everything, God now showed up one evening. I took a three-day fast. And then when I recovered from the three days, I wanted to take my bath. And as the shower came upon my body, and it was chilling, I heard the voice of God. On the 20th of October, 2002, the Lord appeared to me. And he spoke to me, say, I prepared your wife, and the way you are going now, you will not miss it. I wrote it down in my diary. Some of you need to get back to your diary and check it again from 2002, from 1994. Some of the things you are praying about now, the answer is there. But you are still gasping for life. And as I was taking my shower, the Lord spoke to me. He said, the woman you went to see in Jaws, is she prepared? Then my eyes opened. Then I remembered that her mother called me to a corner when she saw that I was a genuine man of God. All right? She called me to the corner and I know she did not know what she was doing. She asked, she told me that that her daughter, she's afraid of her. You? Why are you afraid? He said, the lady, if the lady gets angry, it takes three days before her anger dies down. I said, that's why we are called. We are called to bring deliverance to people that are under yokes. We excel in the ministry of deliverance. We excel there. If you don't have understanding, you can speak in tongues for some ventilation to come. That's why the Lord Jesus put us on, on the spot. We do this kind of thing. Hallelujah. Then my eyes clear. Then that statement the mother made entered my brain. Do you know that this lady, when she gets angry, it lasts for three days. I am a youth preacher. I'm sent to a young generation. In order for you to disciple young people, some of them need to stay in your house sometimes. You need to pastor them at close range. See the level of lawlessness at work in their life. So that you can, by example, revelatory and exemplary dimensions, you can bring discipleship to them practical kind of discipleship now what will happen if i marry a wife that scares everybody away it means that the heart of my essence will be obstructed and that was why the lord said you get it when he explained to me i saw i was a fool do you see even if he does not explain he knows that that your small brain and the small perspective that you captured with which you said why was so myopic that it, it did not, it's not, he it doesn't have stature enough to command his response. So he may answer. If he does answer, you will have to repent. And if he doesn't answer, all the better. Because what? He's king. Take a deep breath on that. And that question you put in your mind since 1984, you can let it slip away now and receive ventilation. I can keep going on even if I don't understand. That's what the work of faith is all about. We do not walk by our mind. We walk from our heart. We, in the mind we die. In the heart we live. Are you with me now? At least I still remember where I stopped. Prophecy. Number one. We must understand the simple gift of prophecy. Turn your Bible with me quickly. Simple gift of prophecy, every believer can prophesy on that level. You see, when you begin to have dealings with God, then you begin to know God. You understand what I'm talking about? He may not, he may not explain. And just in case he decides to explain, you will give him glory. I found out that our understanding is limited. The perspective that we can see in a particular situation is limited. That's why only God can be God. You cannot be God. Now, just in case the devil prides himself as a God, remember, he's not a God. And that's why he cannot determine that you will die tomorrow by 9 p.m. It's not given to him. That power is not in his hands. If I say something now, you call me false. 
But I, I don't have time to prove it in the Bible. So I will not say it today. But I will say it when we have time. I want you to see how the universe runs. So that you know how strong a man is when he is aligned with God. You are very strong. Don't allow principalities come to argue you out of your place of rightness with God. Don't allow that. And I assure you that you are, if you are living in the purpose of God, you cannot die. I assure you. How many of you have come close to death here? Now, do you, do you think you survived because you prayed so much? Most of those times when you came close to death, you were not even strong spiritually. It was not your prayer that kept you. It was a cry that was in your spirit. The cry of destiny. Your destiny will keep crying until it is fulfilled. First Corinthians, please turn with me. We are out of time already. At least so that we can have uh, 25 minutes with which to ascend into the heavens and to gain understanding of the things that were breaking out in the realm of the spirit. Did you feel the release? Amen. Did you feel that release? It was so strong and sustained. It's an indication of the fact that a layer has been removed in the spirit and we were all ushered into another layer. Now the thing you need to understand is this. That layer that we have been ushered into sustains different laws, emphasis, and dealings. The next time you pray, God increase me, just know. That for every increase you experience, for every measure you receive, you need to learn new laws, new principles, and a new scale of emphasis. 1 Corinthians 14. If you are still in the house, say Amen. amen. Can't hear you. Yeah. All right. Amen. Hallelujah. First Corinthians fourteen verse two: For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men. But unto God, for no man understandeth him. How be it in the spirit, he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesied speaketh unto men, unto edification, exhortation, and comfort. Let me explain that. That's the simple gift of prophecy. Every believer can do that. Edification. Exhortation and what? Comfort. Comfort in times of distress, sorrow, and depression. Exhortation, most of the time, when God speaks to you about something, about an assignment, and you believe that you cannot perform that assignment, and your faith is being punctured because the devil, too, is threatening that you don't have enough stature. God sends somebody with a gift of prophecy and he brings exhortation to you so that your soul can line up with the frequency of your spirit because the Bible says that the house that is divided against itself shall not stand. Do you understand it? That's what exhortation does. That's what the motivational preacher calls motivation. But this is not motivation. This is a spiritual liquor, a spiritual tablet that is administered. And when that tablet is administered, Every form of discouragement, every form of inferiority is overtaken. And suddenly, a man of conviction and a man that is ready to fight arises. Now, edification talks about a building up. And see, do you know that when you are fed spiritually, you know? When you are fed spiritually, you know it. You know that you are fed, that your spirit has ate. Your spirit has enlarged. Your spirit is at rest because what it desires has come to it. The Bible says, hope deferred, make it the heart sick. 
But when the desire cometh, it is the tree of life. As you desire God and you come into a place and your desires are met, you know. Because the tree of life finds expression. There's satisfaction and fulfillment on the inside. There's a joy that erupts from the midst of your spirit. That kind of impartation and ministry comes when the spirit of God moves under the auspices of the ministry of life to edify you in your spirit. Comfort and exhortation. Is directed at your soul. Edification is directed at your spirit. This is the scope of the gift of simple, the simple gift of prophecy. Now I need to add something in, the, in this column quickly. Oh my God. Is this permanent? Who brought this? Hey. Do you know how to clean it? Do you know how to clean it? So you'll clean it after the lecture. All right. I need to add something to this column because the spirit of prophecy or the gift of prophecy operating under the column of edification can come also in form of a rebuke. Can come also in form of an instruction. Right? Under this column can come as what? A rebuke. Hallelujah. Please help me tell your neighbor when you are working with God, even the best of us will make mistakes. Now, a spiritual error, please listen. A spiritual error is not necessarily an act of rebellion and disobedience. The spirit realm is like a wilderness. If you are walking in the spirit realm, you need to be directed. And maybe, somehow, in your walk, you now began to take a direction that is not the direction of emphasis. Not because you are rebelling, but because you don't know any better. Oh my God, you are not here. Okay, you have never made a mistake before. Tell your neighbor, you will make mistakes. Not a prophecy, but it's true, you will make mistakes. Oh, they don't believe. Tell, tell them hard again. You will make mistakes in this journey. <laughs> now, I'm a strange kind of person. And my own kind of personality, when somebody comes to me, I embrace them with all my heart. Alright? And a wrong person can come and I can embrace the person. The same way I embrace other people. And not know that the person is wrong. And then suddenly, evangelist Christ comes from, from the shadows. He know he hides his head three days every month. And he comes, and if he comes from that place, he can rebuke anybody, if you, if you are the governor of the state. A rugged evangelist. And many times in his ruggedness, God has used him to save a lot of us. I tell you, you need a rugged man like evangelist Christ on the team. Say amen. amen. And then he just came one morning and started saying, Hush words. But I knew what he was saying. It was the Lord. You see, you must understand at what point God seizes a man's spirit and begins to use his vocal cord to speak to you. Forget about the tone. You are not here. See, forget about the tone. The tone is a, is a, is a function of the person's personality. If the person is a radical, most of the person's utterances come that way. But see, separate the spirit of God from the person. And then he comes out of it is three days fasting and night vigil. And when you see him like that, there's a kind of shirt he, he wears. It means that day, see, just get ready. <laughs> and then some utterances go forth. Then you just find out. Then light just comes to you and you see that you were in error. Tell your neighbor again, you'll make mistakes. Now that's why we need one another. The best of us is not strong enough. And that's why God commits his purpose to his body, not to an individual. Are, you see, you can be right with God and accurate with God, but there's something you need 
that God has released in somebody else in the body of Christ, he will wait.